Hey, welcome back! With the development of electric vehicles slowing down recently, the replacement of oil might take even more than expected. This can open some long-term opportunities and as you are about to see, some of these companies are actually very interesting. Now, commodity prices are all about supply and demand and there is something very important that I want to show you. Right now, in the US, the current projects should be profitable with oil around 35-40 per barrel. However, the new wells are much more expensive and they are going to represent the future supply. In the future, when every US company produces at like 65 instead of 40, oil dropping to 60 or 50 would immediately destroy the supply. With wells, it's a bit more complicated because reopening one after you stop drilling can be very expensive, so what these companies often do is keep producing even if it would be unprofitable and store it. But then you have another limited thing which are tankers and uh, the storage facilities, but that's a whole nother industry. So in the future we might see the average price of oil throughout the cycle go up quite a bit if we look at the supply, but we have to balance it with the demand. One thing to keep in mind is that rate cuts could also be very beneficial. The reason behind high interest rates is to slow down the economy and oil thrives from economic activity. When the Fed cuts the rates, this could increase the demand and would also make debt cheaper for these companies. And if you watched any recent video from me, you know that this is probably the most common catalyst that I talk about, especially for dividend stocks. Now, will they be cut completely or will they maybe remain at 2-3% uh, for half a decade and then rise again and so on? Well, we can't know, but what we know is that the higher they are for longer, the worse it is for oil companies. Plus, another potential risk is politics. There is potential for higher taxes, fewer permits and so on, all of which can affect any of these companies. This, once again, is impossible to predict. But with everything that's happening in the world, owning a bit of oil exposure may not be such a bad idea. To begin with Exxon, they are the third largest oil company on the planet after Aramco and Sinopec. They make most of the money from the classic oil and gas plus energy, chemicals and specialty products. They can make around 10 to 20 or even 60 billion in cash flows depending on the price of oil. We can see that even in 2020 they pretty much broke even. They see the capex growing to 23 to 25 billion this year, so if oil prices remain the same they should make around 30 billion. For a market cap of around 460 billion, that's a ratio of around 15 which is, relatively speaking, a bit high. They had a recent merger with Pioneer, valued at around 60 billion, that should be over in a few months. What's good about this company is that they have a production cost of around 35 per barrel, which can solidify Exxon's production curve around a very nice level. Pioneer was making 3 to 4 billion on average, so they bought them for 15 to 20 times the cash flow, which is not bad for a strategic acquisition. They are close to becoming a dividend king with 41 years of consecutive increases. They pay a dividend of around 3.3%, which represents around 15 billion, and they also spent a similar amount on buybacks recently. They have 96.6 billion in current assets, which is almost enough to cover the current liabilities and the long term debt. So financially this is pretty much exactly what you want to see from a dividend payer. However, I think they have the same issue as ADM. As a commodity company, if you keep increasing the dividend and make a reputation of such a dividend payer, cutting it will affect the stock price. This forces the management to make decisions that may not be the best for the company. For example, in 2020, instead of pausing the dividend and buying a company or assets at a time when nobody wanted them, they had to issue debt to pay the dividend. You got the equivalent of a 3% dividend back then when they could have bought assets that are worth 30 to 40 billion today with the same money, meaning 5 to 9% of the company. And don't forget that they have to keep increasing the dividend, meaning that they have less and less money available to invest, especially if they have to issue debt to pay it. But I think the merger is a good idea because they use the stock to develop the company which can increase the average cash flow. They also plan to do some cost savings targeting 15 billion by 2027. If they manage to do that, that's basically securing the dividend, so it would be very good. I hope they are going to invest it however in things like solar power, hydrogen and stuff like that like their competitors do. Overall, it's not that bad, especially for a dividend portfolio, but not at the current price. I get buying in 2020 when nobody wanted them to basically lock in a 12% dividend, but today for a 3% in the current market I see no reason to buy it. Still better than ADM. 
Now, Chevron, this is the second largest American oil producer and overall around the seventh oil company on the planet by revenues. The cash flow is a bit more volatile with an average of around 15 billion. For a market cap of around 300 billion, that's a ratio of around 20, so they are quite expensive. They also plan a 50 billion merger with Hess, which, unlike Pioneer, doesn't seem that good. The company is barely making any money in the current market and sure, they are investing, but so does Pioneer, even more actually. I looked a bit into it, but I really can't see why they would want such a company, especially not for 30 something times the earnings from the current market. Maybe the assets, but 50 billion for 24 billion in assets and like 14 in liabilities? I think you lose quite a bit as a Chevron shareholder. They have current assets of 41.73 billion, which cover the current liabilities. The total assets are well above the total liabilities, so they are good from this point of view. They pay a slightly better dividend of around 4%, meaning around 12 billion per year, plus similar buybacks. Same as Exxon, they've been constantly increasing it since 1990, so once again, this is an issue. Even without the dividend, Chevron might even lose money in a bad scenario, meaning that they'd have to get even more debt. Think about a bad scenario for uh, half a decade, for example. Just the dividend would add around 60 something billion to the company's debt, which would generate interest and can ruin the balance sheet. And this is the thing with these companies and any other commodity company. You have to look at them throughout the entire cycle, because in good times like today, everyone is doing well, paying dividends, buybacks, growth and so on. But when oil goes to 50 or 40, how many of them will be able to keep investing, doing buybacks and so on? Anyway, a positive thing that I want to mention is that they also invested in hydrogen, carbon capture and renewables and we have to think about the future of these companies. You know, someone has to provide all that hydrogen for example and these companies are ideal to do that. Eventually they'll have to reduce the production of oil due to the demand and sure, it's probably in 3, 4, 5 decades but they have to be ready for a replacement. Plus, as you're about to see, other companies are already doing that. Now, Shell, this is the fourth oil company on the planet with operations pretty much everywhere. What's very interesting is that they are worth less than half of Exxon but make a very similar amount of money. They made around 36 and a half billion last year and on average they can make around 25. This for a 220 billion market cap is a ratio of around 9, which is pretty good, but getting this for half the price in a recession can be very attractive, as you're about to see. They also pay a dividend of around 4%, meaning around 8.75 billion plus very significant buybacks recently. Throughout the cycle, they target to give 30 to 40% of the cash flow from operations as dividends and buybacks. This is ideal because, again, you don't want them to go into debt to pay the dividend. Even 10 billion wouldn't be an issue for the 25 they make on average, but they seem to focus on investing. They have 134 billion in current assets, which cover the 95 in current liabilities, and overall the total assets are well above the total liabilities. So they are in a pretty good financial shape and the interest is something like 4.7 billion so they shouldn't have issues even in a bad scenario. They also plan to save around 2 to 3 billion by 2025 which is not a lot for the market cap but they take a pretty good approach. One thing that I like is that they make targets based on the cash flow. Sure, it's going to depend on the price of oil but investing and taking decisions with the cash flow in mind is definitely a plus for me. They plan to invest 10 to 15 billion in the energy transition from 2023 to 25. Sure, it's not a lot of money and as you're about to see, a smaller company that I'll talk about in a bit is actually investing even more, but this is a step forward. By this, they mean a variety of environmentally friendly products, including hydrogen, carbon capture, low carbon fuels, renewables and more. So, I'd say this is so far the best option, but maybe it's something like 45 to 50 for me. Now, Total Energies, this is a French company with operations pretty much everywhere on the planet. On average, they can make something like 20 billion, which for a market cap of 160 billion is a ratio of around 8, so even cheaper than Shell. The current assets cover the current liabilities and overall they are very similar to the other companies in the video. They pay a pretty attractive 4.7% dividend, which represents around 7.6 billion. Plus, again, pretty significant buybacks. 
We can say that the dividend is actually one of the priorities for the company, targeting an over 40% payout ratio throughout the cycle. So, honestly, I don't see a reason to go for Exxon or Chevron, which are much more expensive and pay a smaller dividend over a company like Shell or Total. Not to mention that in a bad scenario, the lack of flexibility with the dividend can affect the company's balance sheet. They bought a bunch of renewable energy companies recently and, again, we can see a focus on improving the cash flow and, overall, I'd say they are pretty similar to Shell. I think something like, again, 45, 50 would be a pretty attractive price for me. What I don't like about any of these companies is that they do buybacks close to all-time highs. You know, instead of paying 9 billion on buybacks when the price is higher, why not use the money to invest or pay back the debt or do all three of them? To be clear, they do, but why not do more? This is too much money to waste on buybacks. You know, if the company is improving, the price should follow in the long term anyway. Now, Freehold, they are a royalty company with 7.3 million acres in North America, especially in Canada. They target a payout ratio of around 60%, with the current dividend being at above 7% today. By the way, they paid a dividend for the past 27 years, including in 2020. In fact, we can see that historically, they paid the majority of the money they made as dividends, so you could enjoy all the volatility of the commodity. We can see that at the current price of oil, they expect to make around 120 million per year in cash flows after paying the dividend. They break even if they make around 16 million plus interest and taxes. They can use that money to invest or pay back the debt as they constantly do. You know, it's a royalty company, so they don't have the same risk as a producer and it's tough not to be profitable, even if it's just a small amount. They are diversified and we can see that some of their partners are companies that we discuss in this video. They have 55 million in current assets, with zero cash by the way, which cover the current liabilities about two times, half of them being the dividend. They paid back a significant amount of debt recently, and now you can see that they have about 120 million in long-term debt. This is very well covered by the non-current assets, so even if they have to adjust them because of oil becoming cheaper, they should be fine. Overall, I think this one is pretty good. It's a classic royalty company, meaning that they don't have that much leverage and risk and you can get some very nice dividends. I think Freehold is interesting, you know, it's a bit of a different approach. With this one, you can see very well the benefits of buying at a good price. If you bought in 2020 at, uh, let's say, 4.5, you'd get a 22% dividend today after you tripled your money. The issue is that you can buy today hoping to keep getting that 7% dividend. These companies often pay a dividend based on the profit they make instead of a linear one, meaning that you can have some years with uh, the equivalent of a 2% dividend today or even 15. Now, with the huge companies especially, you have the risk of corruption, controversies and potentially things that you can't possibly know until they become public and affect your investment. Plus, a massive risk that affected most of these companies before are oil spills. BP, in fact, actually holds the record for the biggest fine in history due to a massive oil spill from a decade and a half ago. You have to keep in mind that at any point, this can happen again. Maybe it won't bankrupt the company, but it can mean goodbye to dividends for a decade or a massive crash, a lot of debt or even all three. You know, even 20 billion would be a lot of money for any of these companies. But on the other hand, don't underestimate it, especially since we pay much more attention to environmental stuff today than 15 years ago. And now BP, they are smaller but can make quite a bit of money. Once again, most of the money they make comes from oil and gas, but they are investing quite a bit in other sources. They invest in hydrogen, renewables, bioenergy and different EV related things, trying to position for the long term. They plan to invest 6 to 8 billion per year in this by 2025, so in a decade, if they keep it up, this could look like a pretty different company. That would be around the same capex that they want to put into oil and gas, so it's not just greenwashing. They bought back a significant amount of shares recently and paid a pretty good 4.5% dividend, so a bit better than the rest. Despite all the buybacks, this one is the only stock in today's video that's not up in the past 5 years and they are still trading below the early 2020 levels. Depending on the price of oil, they can make 5, 7, 15 and even 30 billion per year in each part of the cycle. For a market cap of around 105 billion, this is trading at around 7 times the average, which is pretty low. They have current assets of 103 billion, which cover the 83 billion in current liabilities. 
With 108 billion in non-current liabilities and 176 in assets, they are okay from a financial point of view. We can see a bunch of investments in both the classic oil and gas plus charging infrastructure, solar and battery storage and that's only in Q4. So they are kind of a hedged bet on oil and uh, if they keep investing and developing the new energy sources, they could do pretty well in the long term. But don't forget about the company's past. Again, this is the company that got the record fine for that oil spill and they have a history of over a hundred years of meddling in politics and wars and lobbying and stuff, so keep that in mind. Look, there isn't enough green on the planet to wash what these companies did. But this doesn't mean that you can't make a lot of money with them. These companies and their profits and ultimately dividends will depend on the global economy because the price of oil is also influenced by economic performance. That translates into demand and we know that supply and demand are key to commodity prices. You can see on the screen what I think about these companies and overall I'd say Total and Shell would be my picks from the industry. So at the right price I think there can be quite a few opportunities in the oil sector. Again, these companies are tied to a commodity so no matter how solid a company may be there will always be ups and downs. But keep in mind that you have to think about the future and the role oil is going to play in it. That being said, these companies can still do very well for another decade or two at least, meaning that, again, at the right price, they have potential. I think the current prices are pretty fair, but with rate cuts stimulating the economy in the near future, we might see even higher prices. And this can again stimulate another investing cycle, more growth, dividends, so there is potential. I'm not that interested in oil stocks at the current price, but if there is a recession or something, they would most likely be traded at a nice discount. I think they can be good in a portfolio as a kind of contrarian bet against the rapid development of EVs and the replacement of fossil fuels. Well, not kind of, this is probably the most contrarian bet since they are basically oil with leverage. Still, I can see them working in some portfolios. As always, what I cover in my videos shouldn't be enough for you to make any investment decision, so please do your own research before investing in anything. If you want to see more videos like this one, please leave a like and even a comment to help me out and make sure to subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.